everyone, it's George Kuros with another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I actually am really excited to uh, have Sarah Westbrook. She is an emotional resilience strategist and her and I have been talking for probably 55 minutes before this, uh, just kind of talking about some of the things. Uh, we're interested, we're both from Canada. And one of the reasons I want to talk to Sarah today is um, really talking about social emotional learning and not just for our students, but for adults as well. And this is an area that she's been focused on for quite a while. She has a really interesting background uh, talking about these things. And I think right now in our time, uh, if we do not take care of the adults, then how can we possibly take care of the kids? And, and I think this is you know one of the reasons that I really wanted to talk to Sarah about this. And I actually wrote a blog post um, just today and Sarah and I were talking about it, talking about, um, for example, professional learning, right? that will provide all these strategies of things that we can do, which are great, but if we don't like address the root causes of what's causing the issues in the first place, uh, then we're probably not gonna be doing really great with this. So Sarah, um, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. I'm really interested in uh, like hearing some of your thoughts on these things and, uh, and what you do, but before we even get into that, can you just, Tell everyone uh, about your work and kind of how you got to doing what you're doing today. So really how I got to do what I'm doing today was a chain of events. I actually started off as a three-year-old who was just going to be a, a famous singer. I said that at three. And then at eight, I started taking singing lessons. By the time I was 11, I was a paid performer working at a dinner theater. And at 11 is when I had a big shift in my life. My parents started to argue, eventually got separated, eventually divorced. There was a lack of relationship with my dad. Then I had dramatic, disrespectful moments at school. And I was really absorbing all of these as impacting my own self-worth and confidence. And my mom at the time could see it. So she ended up putting me into every single leadership character development course she got her hands on. And I'll tell you, George, I didn't want to go to any of them because I was like, mm -hmm. I just want to hang out with my friends. And I didn't realize at 11 years old that my village needed to be mentors, educators, teachers, courses. I thought my village at 11 could just be more friends more friends, more friends, a little bit of stuff, more friends, more friends. But it was a wisdom actually of my mom that said, you know what, no, you need another voice, you need more mentors. And I really started to grab onto certain concepts I was hearing at that young age about mindset and that I wasn't in control of every circumstance, but I was in control of my choice of action, reaction, and belief. So I put these tools in my back pocket and I still continued with singing and then I got into public speaking. And it wasn't until I was actually 19 and I was at a mall singing and a principal came up to me. And they're like, you know what? Uh, can you come to our, my school and sing and let the students ask you questions about how you got to sing for the Blue Jays? And I thought, okay, even though I was afraid because my biggest fear growing up as a especially as a teenager, was if people don't like me. Oh my gosh, what if they don't like me? What if they don't hear my perspective the right way? And so I just took a deep breath. I said, yes, I'm going to do it. And I went to a school. It was in a really tough area. I was singing and the students were asking me questions and they became questions about my life. Were you ever disrespected? What's your home life like? What are your parents like? And it became me pulling tools out of my back pocket about what I now call emotional resilience. And that was the moment that the seed was planted that for me, it was more than singing. Singing was going to be a vessel, was going to be a way to communicate and connect with an audience, but it wasn't going to be my only way. It was going to be speaking and sharing strategies on building emotional resilience. So I started with youth, and then I worked with educators, parents, and also in the workplace. So when you, when you talk about these, like when you talk about this stuff and you started, and I was like thinking about 
some of your experience as a child has really helped you to kind of understand from the person that's struggling, right? And I was actually a horrible kid in high school. And when I became a principal, like none of that stuff phased me because I'm like, I was that kid. And I think a lot of times as educators, um, I know at first, like my first couple of years, I would go home crying like every night because I would take everything personal. Like absolutely everything was like, they, they don't like me, they hate me and stuff like this. But it's, it was like what I sort of realized is that no, like they, they're mad at what's going on at home. And I remember specifically, there was, um, there was a speaker that came out uh, the one, the one day to our like opening day. And they said something and it seems like really simple, but it resonated with me as an adult. And they said, he said, never let an eight year old ruin your day. And I, and I thought about that. I'm like, I'm going home crying over these grade three kids, like being brats. Right. And really is that, you know, like, it, it's probably not me. It's probably something else. Right. And that shifted uh, for me and how I saw this. And I, you know, like, it's not, we didn't address behaviors, but we had an understanding of like where these are coming from and how very few times it's actually personal. Right. And so right now, I think a lot of people are understanding that more because you talk about it from that place of experience, but a lot of educators right now and a lot of adults are actually kind of experiencing the same traumatic things that many of our kids are right? Kind of going through COVID and isolation and things like that. So like, how, how are you, like, what are some of the things that you have, like with kids being isolated, kind of kids being on their own, struggling with some of the stuff that's happening in the world right now? Like, what are some of the strategies that you suggest that we kind of consider as adults? So if I'm talking, and this goes for all ages, I think one of the biggest pieces is allowing yourself to feel. So many times we deny emotion or we make ourselves feel bad and wrong for feeling emotion. You ever caught yourself being like, I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't feel this way. No. And you almost make yourself feel bad and wrong for feeling your own emotion. And then in turn, we can actually do that to other people. We can actually say to say a child, Oh, you're overreacting. Oh, you don't need to, you don't need to be sad. Stop with the sad. So picture that your spouse is telling you not to feel or telling you they're overreacting. How well does that go? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a good, good chance that's going to have an adverse effect that the person is actually going to either shut down altogether, right? Like realize, okay, I, I can't connect with you now. Like I'm shutting right down. Or they're even going to have a heightened emotion because they're not going to feel heard, validated, recognized. And as human beings, we love to feel heard. We love to feel validated and recognized. And one of the quickest ways to hear someone is to go beyond the behavior, beyond the communication that's even happening, and look at what emotion are they feeling. And then honoring that emotion, whether you agree with it or not. See, I think we have a big attachment to whether we agree with the emotion. Like, is that valid? Like if you're feeling a big emotion right now, me being like, mm, is George feeling a valid emotion? I don't know. Okay, he is, all right, so I'll listen. Or if I'm like, no, it's not valid. Now I've pulled away, I'm not listening. And now you're pulling away because you know that I'm not connecting. So I do think that with everything going on, all the uncertainties, there's gonna be emotions triggered from every single direction. And whether it's you personally feeling an emotion or a child is feeling an emotion and now it's triggered an emotion in you to just start with taking a deep breath and recognizing that emotions are natural, normal, and it's okay. Instead of fighting the emotion, instead of trying to be suppressive, because that will only work for so long, mm -hmm. <laughs> actually embracing it and moving with the emotion. Okay, so I gotta, I gotta ask you this as I'm listening to you. And I know that you said you have this connection with, you know, what you're doing now, obviously with music and what you're sharing. One of the reasons I love music is kind of, I, it's almost like counterintuitive to what you're saying a little bit is I hate silence. And part of the reason I hate silence is because I can get into my own head. 
and I can start like, and I'm like, and music kind of blocks that out for me. Right. But there's also, the, and I was like, and I don't know if there's a correlation here, if you see a connection with this, um, there, there's sometimes like, and this will probably date, you know, date me here, but I would listen to like Depeche Mode when I was a kid. because I love Depeche Mode. <laughs> okay. So good, good. And, and the reason I listened to Depeche Mode was it was super depressing music while I was depressed. And it was like, that was like allowing me to kind of embrace that emotion and feel not alone. Like, hey, at least Depeche Mode feels this too, right? So like, is there, a, there's actually a song and we were talking about TikTok before we even got on um, by uh, a young influencer for lack of a better, I don't know if that's what it's called, but uh, her name's Dixie D'Amelio. And her, her song literally is, it's the whole premise is like, sometimes I don't want to be happy, right? And it's like, I would listen to depressing songs just to like embrace my depressed moments or something like that. Like, is there a connection between all this? Well, and, and I think that that's very much a, a vessel to help you move with and through it. Right. I'm thinking, I'm even thinking back to, um, so a, a traumatic event that, that stands out in my mind was when my dad died and it, it was one of those moments I was about 2021 20, at the time and you I knew people died you know I had grandparents died but then when my dad died it was like people really just died like it was just that moment of pure raw realization that life is doesn't last forever and it was almost hard to grieve sometimes without music for me mm -hmm. like I would almost need that song you know like the song I'm thinking of is everybody hurts sometimes right like you can't even listen to that REM song. that's from that album right behind me and you're like and you're listening to it and you're like yeah everybody hurts and you need so there's different ways that we move through emotions and different moments can trigger certain emotions. I think the big thing is allowing yourself to experience. Mm -hmm. We're not always going to be happy and joy. And I think that's why we sometimes make ourselves feel almost belittled or, or shamed for feeling anything other than happy or joy. Cause we almost think, well, that's what I should be. I should just mm -hmm. be like happy and joy. Or maybe you were raised to only be happy. And if you were anything else, you had to go into your room till you had your happy face on again. Uh, so there could be all different reasons why you might have that in your, your mind. But I think to really hold the perspective of you have a wide range of emotions and different circumstances whether they're at work or in your home life or just in the world are going to trigger tons of emotions and all of it's okay. Because if you don't allow yourself to actually feel, I mean, that's going to severely affect emotional, mental well-being, even physical well-being at that moment. Well, and, and it, it, I, first of all, I, I don't know when your father passed away, but you know, my condolences, I know, uh, how hard that is my father passed away and when you're talking about this and kind of connecting i remember um i uh was my dad passed away all of a sudden he was 82 years old had lunch went to nap passed away in his sleep which like that's the way i want to go right like not in my sleep but in a nap those are two different types of sleeps and uh, like, obviously, we didn't get to say goodbye or anything like that. My last words to my father were, I love you, which, you know, I've always been grateful for. Um, and it was like really shocking. And probably about uh, 10, I always had talked about my parents when I worked with schools. I had talked about like their influence on me and, uh, you know, kind of how it shaped my thinking. And then I remember I spoke in Philadelphia and I didn't want to, like, I'm not going to take it out. I'm not going to take that out. And this is probably like 10 days after my father passed away. And I bawled profusely in my talk, talking about, and everyone just knew I was talking, my dad had just died in that room and they were so supportive and amazing. And I, 
always talk about my father in, and sometimes, uh, and it's a way, it's a way to grieve. It's a way to honor. And, uh, some people will say to me like, Hey, when you're talking, like, how do you like turn on those tears? I'm like, that's not, that's not turned on. That's what I'm going through. Like some days, uh, I don't cry when I talk about my dad and some days I do, right. Some days, you know, something affects you in a different way. It like, literally, I know this sounds weird. Uh, I'm more likely to cry when I talk about my dad, when I don't have sleep, like when I have little sleep, like I'm way more emotional in that in those moments. And I found that actually through speaking through that kind of being vulnerable and talking about those, that impact, it has actually helped me significantly to kind of, you know, to, I don't, I don't want to ever say be okay with it. Cause obviously I'm not okay with my dad, but di- dying, but it really helped me through that process. And, and when you're, when I'm thinking about this and, and thinking about your work and how people are um, you know, the adults are dealing with this stuff right now, like what are some of the strategies like what are some like concrete strategies that you kind of talk about with uh you know adults and things that they can do to like help themselves through this time where they're also trying to deal with like i don't know if it's like the term would be secondary trauma but like they're dealing with the trauma of kids while they're dealing with their own trauma at that time like what are some like really concrete strategies that you'd suggest for educators well one of the things, and I love that you shared that story, and that this proves the point of when you share a story with someone, when I shared about my dad, it opened up a connection for you to share about your dad, because that might not have been a story you would have necessarily brought up during this podcast. No, no. And so, and I think that there's power in sharing, but what's really difficult with sharing is, again, it triggers big emotions. We start to feel may vulnerable or nervous to share maybe we're not sure what the response is going to be with sharing so sometimes we don't want to deal with that vulnerability so we just put it away and we say oh no you know i'll just deal with it myself and i think one of the biggest things is bringing something to the light so in order to really move with and through something i think you have to bring it to the light and really acknowledge it's okay not to feel okay. It's okay to go through really tough circumstances. Like, look, even we have a commonality with our dads dying. People in the, watching this podcast may have had that experience or they may not have, but they don't need to have the same experience. We don't need to have the same experience mm-hmm. as someone in a different country to actually have a connection because we're connected through our emotions. We're connected through you saying, you know what? I have felt pain before. And I'm like, yeah, me too. Or you've been sad and it's been really triggered because of tired. And I can be like, oh yeah, no, I've had that too. And so now we're connecting, even if we don't have the exact same circumstance. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most valuable tools that we have and that we all have is the ability to share and Uh, If you don't feel comfortable sharing it out loud with someone right away, whatever you're going through, please don't just keep it in here, in in your head, in your heart, like take a piece of paper, write it out, you know, write out everything that's going on, every emotion you're feeling. If you don't want anyone to find it, because you just want to get it out of your head and heart, rip it up, throw it away, but keep on getting it out of your head and your heart so that you're not just burying it. There's that uh, visualization. George, do you like visuals? I do. Okay. So I, I, I picture that the, so it's going to be March break. It's Friday and, and you're going to go out with your friends. So you're trying to rush around in your locker and by accident, you tip over your chocolate milk. But they're all like, come on, George, let's get going. You know, it's going to be March break. You're like, oh, okay, I'm going to deal with that later. So you shut the locker door and out you go. 10 days later, you return to the school. What's happened with that chocolate milk? It's not chocolate milk anymore. It is moldy. It's gone rancid. And you're late for class. So you're like, you know what? I'm just going to deal with that later. I'm going to shut the door. Now there's a smell coming from it, (laughs) right? Like it's, and, and. Now you're. I know bl- this podcast is going to be chocolate milk and your emotions. Yeah, well, and it's, all your emotions are like chocolate milk. It's very similar. Like I mean, let's <laughs> emotions, chocolate milk, tomato, tomato, 
and at this point now, your locker reeks, okay? And you, right. you are using your friend's locker at this point. You don't even go there. And finally, the custodian's like, okay, it's something around here smells. They narrow it down <laughs> in the report. It's your, it's George, it's your locker, okay? It's been three weeks. It, it reeks. Let's open it up. You open it up. The chocolate milk is moldy and it's growing on your books and everything else. This is a very visual visual. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a writer, a songwriter. So now let's pretend the chocolate milk is a challenge or a tough emotion you're feeling. And you're like, you know what? I'm gonna deal with that later. I'm gonna push that there. But then when later comes around, you got another thing you're doing. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna push that down. I'm gonna, yeah, I got, I'm gonna deal with that later. Oh, I'm gonna deal with that. And now all of a sudden, it's bigger, it's grown. It's like, you know, only mold grows in deep, dark places. You've got to bring it out to the light to start diminishing it. So my big piece of advice in all of that <laughs> is don't spill your chocolate milk. <laughs> and if you do, clean it up. No, is really bring your emotions and your thoughts and your challenges, what's going on to the light so that you can actually start moving with them and through them, not keeping them buried, that they're only going to fester and eventually catch up to yeah, you. Yeah, like just, I, I appreciate that advice, but personally, I'll tell you, I don't let any food go bad anywhere near me because it's like one of my phobias because okay. I get really sick. So if that's true, then I deal with my feelings like really quick before they can turn that way. Well, see, there we go. That's my phobia. That's like a phobia of mine of, is moldy bread. I'm terrified of moldy bread. Now, and, and anytime <laughs> you are thinking about not dealing with an emotion or something that's really bothering you, now you're going to associate it with mold and you're going to deal with it. <laughs> you're welcome. I appreciate that. So like, it's actually, it's interesting because one of the things that uh, like people listen to this podcast, they might know me through my blog and one of the things that you talk about is, you know, kind of having that opportunity to like share and connect. And when I first started blogging, it was, um, it was really to kind of share my learning things that are going on, but then it became like a process where if I didn't kind of like, now I'm like got this chocolate milk analogy in my head. If I didn't like get it out, it would start to like almost give me headaches. Like I felt like I couldn't kind of go through that pro and maybe it's because of, I'm terrified of moldy bread. So maybe <laughs> that's, maybe that's the whole, I just like totally under my thoughts the entire time, but like that now it's become a process. And sometimes I'll actually say, uh, I'll write like, Hey, I'm not, I'm not, uh, writing this to share my learning. I'm writing this to learn. So I actually like in the, in the writing, in that process, it is me like just getting stuff out and kind of working through, um, like what I'm, I don't know, necessarily like thinking what I'm feeling to kind of like work through that because sometimes it's harder for me to like process and, and probably that's one of the times where I don't have music on where I don't have noise going on in the background. That's when it is silence and I can concentrate, but it's hard for me to kind of get it like stuck in my head as opposed to like get it, you know, written down somewhere. So maybe, maybe that is like the, the moldy bread chocolate milk analogy. Yes. Yeah. So we'll call it like we could do like a whole whole course on you it. Should write a, you should write a song on this, I think. Moldy bread, chocolate milk. <laughs> right. Okay, so there's one thing that you um, that you wrote, um, and I was reading through um, your website and your stuff, and we'll you'll see Sarah's uh, website in the description uh, below, so you can make sure you connect with her on Twitter, Instagram, and connect with her uh, on her own website. But you talked, and this is something I really struggle with. You talked about the notion of like praise efforts regardless of results, right? And I like I I I understand that. I understand the process of that. I try to be good about it, um, but I also struggle with it not only as a dad, uh, but like as an educator, right? Like I, one of the things like my daughter and I play video games together and she's four. So like I beat her every single time and I'm not like going to let her win because, right. because when she does win, 
then and and some people we, i've had tons of conversations about this kind of philosophy it's like no no like, like let the kid do that i'm like but then when they win they, they they don't know if it's like legit or not right so like we have to have these conversations about this because when she wins and for real then it's like we played hungry hippos and now she can beat me in this every now and then and the excitement from that is so much better so like there is a tangible thing about results um that we have but like like tell me more about that philosophy and like i don't think it's don't worry about results right but it's kind of maybe focusing on something else or maybe i'm misreading that no no and we're the same way so i have an eight-year-old son he's very competitive loves sports loves video games card games anything that involves that competitive spirit camaraderie and we're the same way you know, you have to put in the effort and legitimately win. And, and there is a reward in, in that your effort has paid off. And that right. was always our big slogan. And is to this day is effort pays off. And I'll even do it as a rhyme team. I'll be like, effort pays <laughs> off. And I'll, I'll be like, effort. And he'll be like, pays off. I'm like, yes. There you go. <laughs> and so... And the big thing for me is really focusing on the character traits that that we believe are important to get to an end result, or that we we know are important to have a successful outcome. So let me give you give you a scenario. Our son plays hockey. The thing that matters to my husband and I most isn't about how many goals he hits top shelf, isn't about how many times he can zip around the, the ice as fast as he can. It matters, are you putting in the effort? Are you being determined? Are you being respectful of yourself and others? And if you get that goal top shelf, it's the icing on the cake. Right. And so I think that's the focal point is what kind of effort is going into it? Because if you are doing, even if the, the result is great, like here, let's put it on the side of, say he gets a hat trick, but we can tell he's hardly putting in any effort. It's just one of those days or teams where he could just kind of skate around and oh, but really he's not putting in the effort. It could have gotten he could have gotten even more in he could have been more of a leader on the ice had more compassion to another player that's the stuff i'm really focusing on and my husband's really focusing on yeah like i think part of it too is um for me like I, i've been thinking about this a lot uh i'm like on like my own like little weight loss journey and i've actually lost probably about 30 pounds since i started this uh, wow. I think about two months ago. Yeah. And the, uh, it, it, like you, I remember like I have been so adverse to like going on a scale. Right. And I just hated it. Right. And then I like sucked it up and went in and it was like, uh, I felt like I was just like, I had an idea of what my weight was and it wasn't even close to that. Cause I hadn't been on it so long and it like really hit me. I'm like, like, you know, and then now like I have like a goal weight and stuff like this. And I think at first that really was a problem with me. And now like my, what I'm trying to like recognize through this process is the steps I'm taking to get there and excited about that. And we're like, what I'm excited about is now that I'm like measuring stuff and seeing progress mm -hmm. as opposed to like, why am I not at this weight right now? Like, why am I not at this space? And I think it's helping me in other aspects of my life kind of going through that too. Um, and, and kind of identifying, like, how do I like identify, like I, I'm working, like sometimes you, people get frustrated when they work hard and don't get results. But I think what happens is that they don't get the final result as opposed to they don't see the little steps that we were taking through that process. And so that's really kind of like, as you're talking about that, like the, the effort is there, but you do want to, you don't, might not get to like the end point, like the hockey analogy, you know, uh, using top shelf. Um, but are you like getting closer to that? Are you getting to that space? Right. Cause it almost to some point, like I've talked about this before, uh, I used to run marathons and you have this goal of running a marathon and you work your way to it. 
and then you get to it and then there's a thing called runner's depression and what runner's depression is, is that when you don't actually have this ultimate goal anymore you actually it actually is, gives you a really hard time emotionally because you kind of like feel like well, what what's my life now if i'm not training for this race right if i'm not doing this so it's like part of how to deal with runner's depression is to um, continuously kind of set these smaller goals, like have aspirations, because it's not good to run a marathon every week, right? And it's right. not good to do that part. Right. And I think that we you, having an end result in mind is great. You know, you have an end result in mind. But I th the, the part of the process is, especially when we're talking about kids, so if we're talking about our you know, kids for for this example, that you have an end result in mind, whatever that may be, whether it's dad, I want to win hungry hippo or, you know, then, okay. So that's your end result. Mm -hmm. And what are you doing to get there? And then we're helping them with strategy. So when you're hitting the hungry hippo, well, dad's doing it a lot faster. So what could you do? You're only using one hand right now. What could help you do that faster? Oh, you could use two. Okay, so when you use two and you're pumping really hard, look at the determination. Look at the effort you're putting in. And really getting them to concentrate on what does it take to get to that end result. Whether they get there that time or not, doesn't matter, I believe, as much as that we're concentrating on the character traits, the effort, and then saying, and when, as you're practicing, right. as you're putting in the effort, look at you're getting better and better. And that goes back to that growth mindset. And so of course that is very much what us adults have to model. You know, when we want our kids to learn something, the best way is to model it. We want our students to learn something, the best way is for us to model it. And for us to also praise ourselves Right. for the steps along the journey. Even when you're talking about whether it's a marathon is the end result or a certain weight as the end result, to not be down on ourselves because we haven't instantly got there. Because we would tell kids, effort pays off, it takes time and dedication, determination, and then to ourselves, we're like, I needed to be there by now. I need like. Right, right. <laughs> Almost giving ourselves the same grace and the same encouragement instead of being really hard on ourselves and that only impacts our emotional and mental mm -hmm. well-being to the negative now of course we need to give ourselves a kick in the rump from now and and and, and then right like sometimes you just you need to be like okay i slacked off for a bit but my effort's going to pay off and i need to to do a little bit more practice today to get to that end result that i want but at least you're not just so focused on the end result and you're not giving yourself praise for that you're doing steps to get there. Because if you're only focused on the end result, when you get there, and this goes back to that marathon yeah. thing, so I can totally see this. You're, there's that moment where you're like, oh, I'm here, but now I gotta create another there. And then right. you get there and you're like, oh, I'm here now, but I gotta create another there and then I'm here. So if you don't enjoy the process, I think you're always going to be looking for more. Yeah. Like, like I'm thinking about this analogy, you know, uh, since we're predominantly talking to like educators, I would have like a similar thing with, you know, the end of the school year, right? You're like looking forward to that moment, getting your kids to that point. And then you're like, I need a break. And then you get there. And then two days later, you're like restless, right? And you have this and it's kind of like, hey, we got to also kind of like step back from some of this stuff too. We got to take a break or maybe like focus on a different area uh, to, to do this because sometimes it's like just kind of like a never ending loop of, the, of these things and it can, can be overwhelming too, right? Um, Absolutely. You, you also mentioned uh, the really the importance of like modeling this stuff as adults, right? And I think we hear a lot about like uh, people talk about like Brene Brown and vulnerability, how important that is. And I think a lot of times, um, I remember when my dog passed away it was like my first brush of death. This is before my father passed away. And like really first time, like what a blessing that I had not dealt with any, anyone or anything close to me dying until like I was in my thirties. Um, and uh, I remember like sharing with my students how hard it was for me and how tough it was. And I, I felt like, cause I was a principal at the time, 
they connected with me in a totally different way because they saw me being emotional and saw me struggling with these things right but they had maybe saw me as like like a big guy who like played sports and like you know uh maybe was like unfazed by these things but that's not a reality right and i was you know com- like we have to be comfortable with that vulnerability and uh I think that's like, you know, something I'm, I'm really getting, you know, as I'm talking to you now, Sarah, you, you said you're really into music, right? Yes. I warned you this ahead of time and we're almost out of time here. So you are Canadian. I'm Canadian. So I asked you and I didn't give you any prep time. Okay. So I want to, I want to, this is you being vulnerable now. Okay. Right? Who are your top, give me like your top five Canadian bands. And who are they? And I, I just had Sean Gaylord on the podcast. We did a Boy Man Elite Eight. I'm really into music, so I want to see who you're, who you like. And you might even be like the top five you can think of off the top of your head. So let's so see. Be Canadian. They have to be Canadian. Yeah. Who you got? And can it be a solo artist? Hundred percent. As long as you're Canadian. Okay, Celine Dion. Right. And you said that was the first thing you told me. You want to be Celine Dion. She's she's. She- she's my girl well she's yeah that's your that's like your that's that's like not even your that's your top one canadian are you saying that okay yeah um second you know who i really like the music of very often is sean who sean mendez green ontario not far from not too far from me okay uh sean mendez hey i would have never suggested that but you know some of the and then he's got a couple yeah he's got like some, the senorita one right yeah but there's one of his first ones and i and i can't think of it right now but it's a really good upbeat one um the you other, gotta start on vine do you know that you gotta start on vine which is like which is old person tiktok <laughs> well, i'm just gonna do um myspace remember that <laughs> yeah, i do remember that okay you got celine dion sean mendez who else you got pops into my mind just you know pure canadians bare naked ladies yeah right that would be um, i think that's one on my list okay Brian adams Brian, like that's like canadian brian adams is like canadian well i, I slow dance to so many of students <laughs> in grade eight yeah uh, and then last, but definitely not least, I'm going to go with <laughs> Shania Twain. No, Shania no. Twain. Okay. No. Yeah, that's All right. what. I'm- All right. So here, I'll give you, these are mine. Let's see how, let's see if you're like, oh, I should have picked this one. Okay. okay. Uh, Drake. To- Drake would be one. Okay. Yeah. I love, I love me some Drake and I just love Drake because I also loved Degrassi and he was on Degrassi. You know this, right? Okay. So he's one, uh, not school appropriate for all the educators listening though. Just give you the heads up. Don't be dropping Drake in the middle of grade three class. Uh, in the staff room. <laughs> Justin, Justin Bieber. I'm a big, I'm a believer. Okay. okay. I love Justin Bieber. Uh, he, uh, I actually remember when I was a principal, the, my students said to me, they're like, we're, we're leaving school and we're going to the mall today. I'm like, Oh, is that right? And like their parents are there to pick them up. So I'm like, what are you doing there? And they're like, Justin Bieber is there. I'm like, who? And like Justin Bieber. I'm like, I don't know who that is. And they're like, you should watch uh, never say never on Netflix or like just watch, I can't remember if it's on Netflix or not. I'm like, I'm not watching some stupid like boy singer. And then, and then it was like Friday and I wasn't doing anything. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna watch this and be good to talk about the kids. And by the end I'm like, never say never. And I was like crying by the end of it. So like, this is like, a, it was like, I, I really like that story. Now I know he's had some issues and stuff like that. I, I, I'm a still a believer, I like him, okay? Uh, I can't, I'm surprised you didn't say this. Tragically hip. You don't like tragically hip? Oh, oh, I didn't think of it. Yeah, too bad. You're gonna <laughs> you're gonna lose your Canadian card now. So <laughs> that's like one. Uh, Sarah McLaughlin is one of my favorites. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sarah McLaughlin. Uh, I I would like maybe say the bare naked ladies. 
Okay. Uh, maybe I'd say them, but because you said them, I'm going to offer, do you know this band, Sloan? Do you know Sloan? Yes, but I can't think of a song. <laughs> they <And> sing, I... <laughs> hey, you. Da, da. I can't remember how it goes. You know it. It's like, dun, dun. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm giving you. Okay, yeah, okay. You, that know, was... you know it. I, 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 you know it. I know you know that song. How about Our Lady Peace? <gasps> yes, Our Lady Peace. Okay. Our Lady Peace story. Okay, I loved Our Lady Peace. And actually, you just, I'm not going to put Our Lady Peace in mine. Okay. I'm going to put Chantal Kurviatic. So her, so the song Surrounded was one of my cry songs. I love that. That's, that's like in my all-time favorite songs list is the song Surrounded by Chantal Kurviatic. So I went to see her play uh, at like a, a pub when she wasn't very big in Saskatoon when I went to university. And she, the reason I'm bringing this up is because she dates or she's married to the lead singer of Our Lady Peace. And I was sitting with the lead singer of Our Lady Peace the entire time and had no clue until the end of the concert. True story that nobody from the United States cares about right now. Yeah, well, but maybe the one. It was like, nobody knows who these people are. But Chantal Kurviatic, Surrounded, one of my favorite songs. Uh, the one we were talking about this too, whenever I go to the United States, like nine times out of 10, uh, Americans will come up to me and they'll say, hey, you're from Canada? Do you know Rush? And like Rush is huge in the United States. I cannot name one Rush song for the life of me. And I'm pretty into music. Yeah. Do you know any Rush songs? I, off the top of my head, to be honest, I am not, I have my phone, I'm like. Yeah, I was gonna say, you're like, you're looking at something. This is like cheating here right now. So I, I actually, um, I'm looking, Raj, I, I'm not great at titles. I'm, I'm like, a, this is what I am. I'm a face person, okay. so, uh, a name. I've got to really focus on names. My husband laughs at me when I'm giving directions. I'll be like, you know that big oak tree? Well, when you hit the big oak tree, turn right, as opposed to saying the street name. I think I'm a very visual person. Which is interesting because you're really into music. Can I use this as an excuse? Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Rush songs. This is the, this is the I list. Don't I don't know any. Even oh. if you say them, I'm not going to know them. Oh, okay. Well, then. <laughs> Next time we should do like some sort of karaoke yeah. version. We should. Well, I know you're a singer. And I, I, unfortunately, even though you're a singer, I'm the only one who is sang on this podcast. So I apologize to everybody. That is not the norm for Canadian singers. So um, anyways... I just wanted to end with that. I wanted to like, you know, I'm trying to do, uh, love these little personal vignettes so we can kind of know the person behind the work. And uh, Sarah, I really appreciate you being here uh, because I think, especially now, one of the things that I've really tried to like work myself is, is that as an educator, I've always said like, we need to do what's best for kids. Yeah. And I think that one of the things I've really tried to understand and really try to get better at is that serving the adults is what's best for kids. What? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes we do the opposite. And so that's really why I want to talk to you because I know how passionate you are about that. But before we leave Sarah, like where can people like find you, read more about your work and all these things you're going to list, they'll also be in the description, but I would just love to hear them from you. Yes. And George, just to springboard off what you said, I 100% agree. We've got to take care of the educators. They are a huge part of the village that helps raise our children. And if they're not emotionally, mentally well, you can't give what you don't have. And my last analogy for you after the chocolate milk. After one the is, chocolate milk debacle. <laughs> Or you stick them into a flashlight, inspect it to shine. Yet sometimes we will drain ourselves and we all stick ourselves into conversations, work, and expect it to shine. So to the educators, really taking care of recharging your batteries so that you can keep doing the amazing work that you continually do because our children need you, we need you, you're an essential part of the village. And to find out more about me and what I do and the strategies I provide for educators, parents, students, and in the workplace for emotional resilience, 
is my website and I have two different ones. So I'll, I'll send them both to you. Yeah. And instead of rhyming them off, then maybe people won't like trying to get the pen and paper going quickly. Right. Uh, the easiest one is sarahwestbrook.com. And the other one's a little bit longer, so I'll send that. Definitely Instagram, I am Sarah Westbrook, is a great place. I do small videos for strategies on emotional resilience. Twitter, which is just Sarah Westbrook, and also Facebook, Sarah Westbrook. And, and soon TikTok. Okay, well that, it, maybe better. <laughs> How about you and your channel? Yeah, TikTok, that's the way. Anyways, Sarah, thank you so much for taking the time. And... We, Sarah and I would love to hear your favorite Canadian musician. So if you are watching this on YouTube, throw it in the comments. We'd love to like hear some of the, uh, and, and if you list one, we also want to know where you're from, but, or you can throw it to us uh, on Twitter. We'd love to hear that. So Sarah, thank you so much for having me and everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.